In his secluded home in the country, Charles Darwin was conducting experiments and jotting down notes that would lead to a revolution in science. At a quiet table in a public library, Karl Marx was reading and writing out ideas that would later lead to a revolution in politics. Across the ocean in America, Susan B. Anthony was organizing marches and demonstrations that would revolutionize the role of women in society. And in luxurious quarters in Munich, near the palace of his friend the king, a German with a distaste for the past and a print for the future was composing the fiery operas that would revolutionize music. The time was the second half of the 19th century. The man was Richard Wagner, the greatest composer of German opera. He created an entirely new art form with his music and in so doing profoundly affected European musical, literary, and theatrical life. People had intense reactions to Wagner's music when they first heard it, and it's still the same today. It's the type of music people either love or hate. There's almost no middle ground. People respond to Wagner himself the same way. There was as much in the man to admire as there was to deplore. Like his music, he was a man of extremes and driving passions. He had limited self-control, and although he had some very high ideals, his morals are far more ambiguous. He spent money lavishly, usually other people's money. He pampered himself and demanded luxury, even though he claimed to uphold Schopenhauer's principle of self-denial. He had a series of love affairs, mostly with other men's wives, while telling his own wife she should put up with it because he would bring her fame. He saw himself as a rebel and a revolutionary, yet he eagerly took favors from any noble who would offer them, and he preached about freedom and human rights while writing scathing indictments of Jews. He was a man who gave a great deal to the world and took equally as much. Wilhelm Richard Wagner was born in Leipzig, Germany, on May 22, 1813, and even his birth was a source of controversy. His father was supposedly Karl Friedrich Wagner, his mother's husband, a police clerk who died shortly after Wagner was born. But everyone in town knew that Wagner's mother had an intimate friendship with a painter-playwright named Ludwig Geyer, whom she married as soon as her husband was dead. There were nine children in the Wagner household and indulgent with Richard, the youngest. He told Richard he wanted to adopt him as his own son, and even passed his name on to him. Until he was fourteen, Richard Wagner was known as Richard Geyer. None of this helped with the local gossip, which held from the start that Richard was Geyer's natural son. Still, all these doubts about parentage didn't affect Wagner too much, except for one fact. Richard Geyer was Jewish, and anti-Semitism was alive and well in Europe in the 1800s, as it had been for centuries. Historians have often wondered if it wasn't the mere idea of being partly Jewish that turned Wagner into the fanatical anti-Semite he later became. It's a theory people have sometimes applied to Adolf Hitler, too, for there were rumors of illegitimacy and Jewish blood in his background. Later, Wagner and his music would become favorites of the dictator. As a child, Wagner was no Mozart. Although he liked the arts, he showed almost no musical abilities. His mother insisted on piano and violin lessons, but one teacher said Wagner would never amount to anything, and another teacher proclaimed him his worst pupil, in the teacher's words, intelligent but lazy. Wagner never learned to play a single instrument with any amount of skill. None of this bothered the young student. He found himself more attracted to writing than to music anyway. As a teenager, he was addicted to Homer and Shakespeare, and even wrote his own variation on Hamlet. He killed off so many characters in the first two acts, 42 to be exact, that there was no one left for the third act. He had to bring them all back as ghosts, so his story would have an ending. Then, when he was still a teenager, Wagner heard the opera Freischutz by German composer Karl Maria von Weber. Freischutz was a typical romantic German story, gloomy and magical, all about the battle between true love and the forces of nature. Wagner loved it, and right then and there, he decided to become a composer. He said, in ecstatic dreams, I met Beethoven and Shakespeare. I talked with him, and I awakened bathed in tears. Wagner began to listen to and study the greatest composers of the century before him, notably Beethoven and Mozart. He picked up harmony, counterpoint, and orchestration and began to write his own compositions. Scholars have always been amazed by how much Richard Wagner learned simply by listening. Wagner's family wasn't happy about his choice of careers. There were many performers in the family, and they all agreed that Wagner, too, had acting skills. They'd hoped he'd become a performer, a profession in those days that offered steady employment. Wagner couldn't be swayed. He enrolled at Leipzig University, where he could study under Theodor Weinlig, a successor to Bach. His formal training with Weinlig lasted only six months. It was the only training Wagner had his entire life. 
But with Weinlig's help, Wagner had two of his compositions published, neither of which received any attention from the public. He continued to study at the university and to use his free time getting drunk with his friends and losing his mother's money in gambling houses. At 18, he started his first opera, which he never completed, and at 21, he wrote his second opera, which was completed but never performed in his lifetime. By now, he was a full-time composer and also a full-time pauper. Wagner faced the dismal truth that he would have to get a job. His brother landed him a position as a chorus master in the theater in the town of Würzburg, where he started his third opera and a few casual affairs with various actresses. It's not surprising that his third opera, based on Shakespeare's play Measure for Measure, came across in general as a celebration of promiscuity and lust. After that, Wagner moved to the town of Magdeburg to take another position as musical director of a small theater company. He didn't like Magdeburg and was all set to return home to Leipzig when he met Minna Planer. Minna was the leading actress in the company. She was unmarried with a six-year-old daughter, uneducated and not very cultured, but experienced and full of zest. Wagner was infatuated. They had a two-year affair, and then they married. It was a long marriage and a stormy one. There were fights and accusations, reconciliations and apologies, more fights, separations and reunions, and infidelity on both sides. In only the first few months, they had a quarrel about Wagner's future. Minna wanted him to write music that would cater to public tastes, so he could make some money. Wagner wanted to experiment with his own styles and borrow money from everyone else. They separated after only six months and then reconciled. The debts continued to mount, and Wagner took a post as music director in a new and elegant theater in the Russian city of Riga. It paid only a modest salary, and modest wasn't the lifestyle Wagner had in mind. He wrote to a friend at that time, I must have money or I shall go mad. He charmed both friends and strangers into giving him loans, loans he never repaid and considered instead to be donations to his genius. The people of Riga didn't feel quite the same way. Things got so bad for the Wagners, they had to leave in haste and flee to Paris. It would be the first of many departures brought on by irate citizens and governments. To get to Paris, Richard and Minna took a roundabout route that enabled them to avoid creditors in East Prussia. They went to France via Norway and then took a boat to England. The voyage normally took eight days, but the seas were so stormy it took three weeks before they landed in London. It was this windy, interminable journey that inspired Wagner to write his great opera, The Flying Dutchman. It was based on the legend of a captain who was condemned to sail the seas forever. Once in France, Wagner met the popular German composer Giacomo Meyerbeer, who so praised Wagner's work that Wagner wrote to him, It is a great happiness to be indebted to you. Later he would denounce Meyerbeer and all other Jews in his essay, Judaism in Music. Wagner arrived in Paris full of hope and confidence and sure he would be a sensation. Instead, he fell into the darkest, most desperate years of his life. He and Minna lived in wretched poverty in a tiny apartment located in a neighborhood full of other starving artists. They shared their apartment with another lodger, whom Minna had to wait on hand and foot, even cleaning the man's dirty shoes. They pawned everything they owned until Minna was left only with the dress she was wearing. To pay for their food, Wagner took a series of menial and badly paying jobs, including reading proofs, transcribing, translating, and writing hack novels and sketches. He even tried for a job in the chorus of a rundown theater, but that failed when the director discovered Wagner couldn't carry a tune. In spite of all this struggle and deprivation, Wagner continued to create. He finished The Flying Dutchman, which had a successful debut in Berlin, and he completed his opera, Rienzi, which was accepted at the Opera House in Dresden. After three torturous years in Paris, the light at the end of the tunnel began to glimmer. Because of the success of his two operas, he was offered a position as royal conductor at the Opera House in Dresden, an esteemed title with a decent salary attached to it. Wagner took the position and remained in it for six years, but he never liked it. He hated the restrictive schedule of rehearsals and performances and found the salary still too low for his tastes. He continued to plummet into debt. During his years in Dresden, Wagner met other eminent composers, including Felix Mendelssohn, Robert Schumann, and Hector Berlioz, but he was never able to form friendships with them or any other composers. To Wagner, they were not colleagues, they were competitors. In the Dresden years, Wagner wrote the medieval operas Tannhauser and Lohengrin. He was still in his early thirties. In spite of his steady work and the achievements of his operas, Wagner was once again accumulating angry creditors. He was also accumulating political ideas. His political fervor started over a personal professional matter. He suggested changes in the Dresden Orchestra, 
and when those changes were rejected, he saw it as oppression. His rights and freedom as an artist had been violated. Wagner became convinced that musicians were treated unjustly and that the management of theaters was too inept to promote creativity. He became attracted to the idea of revolution and conceived the idea for an epic poem called Siegfried's Death, in which the Norse hero was really a German socialist in disguise. It was his vision of the future man of Germany. He delivered fiery speeches about the end of the aristocracy, the abolishment of the army, and the need to change from a monarchy to a republic. About a year after Wagner threw himself into this passionate cause, there was an insurrection in the streets of Dresden. Royal troops were called to fire on the crowds, the streets were barricaded, and the rebel leaders were rounded up and arrested. Wagner, who had joined the crowd, decided he'd better get out of town quickly. He posed as a coachman and fled to the city of Weimar, where he hoped Franz Liszt, a composer he'd met briefly, might offer him asylum. But police warrants for his arrest as a politically dangerous individual followed him to Weimar, and he had to flee to Zurich, Switzerland. Minna joined him there later, and the two would remain in exile in Zurich for ten years. The warrant for the arrest of Richard Wagner, then 36 years old, gives a detailed physical description of him. It says he's of medium stature, brown hair, open forehead, brown eyebrows, gray-blue eyes, nose prominent, and mouth proportionate, chin round, and he wears spectacles. Special characteristics are rapid in movements and speech. Wagner was resentful and bitter in Zurich and stopped composing altogether. Instead, he wrote several dogmatic papers on art, music, and the future, the most notorious being Judaism and Music, which was a neurotic attack on Jewish influence in the art form. It was inspired partly by his jealousy over the success of Jewish composers Felix Mendelssohn and Meyerbeer. The years from 1848 to 1853, when Wagner was between the ages of 35 and 40, are called his wasted years. He not only directed his talents towards prideful and vindictive writings, he directed his passions towards a series of love affairs, some secret, most of which he flaunted openly. He planned to elope with one 22-year-old heiress, but when her husband threatened to shoot Wagner, the girl backed off. Wagner was furious at what he termed the girl's weakness of character and lamented, The woman who was to have brought me salvation has proved herself a child. Wagner finally came out of his non-musical period and began work on what's known today simply as The Ring, but its full title is The Ring of Nibelungen. It was a series of four operas based on ancient Nordic mythology with a decidedly German flavor. The series took 21 years to complete. He took up with a wealthy pair of music lovers named Otto and Matilda Wiesendonk, who installed them in a cottage near their villa. The three had an intimate and unconventional relationship. Matilda and Wagner fell deeply in love, and Otto, committed to them both, was acceptant and understanding. Still, it was a situation that didn't present any easy or happy solutions. Wagner put aside the ring for a while and poured his frustrations and sadness into Tristan and Isolde, an opera whose main characters, Tristan, Isolde, and King Mark, were really Wagner, Matilda, and Otto. Wagner's wife, Minna, didn't take her husband's latest affair in as much stride as the betrayed husband. There was another argument, yet another reconciliation, and then a temporary separation. When the composer Franz Liszt arrived in Zurich with his daughter, Cosima, he was able to reconcile the couple. Minna set out for Dresden to try to win amnesty for her husband, so they could return to Germany. The amnesty was approved, and Minna arranged to meet Wagner in Paris, where they could continue on to Germany, leaving the tumultuous years of Zurich behind them. The tumult was behind them, ahead was humiliation. Wagner wanted to present one of his operas in Paris, but discovered that every opera performed at the Grand Opera House had to have a ballet. Tannhauser, the opera Wagner had chosen, had no ballet. So he obligingly revised the first act. This did nothing to please the ballet dancers, who by tradition appeared in the second act. With the help of the dancers' friends, opening night was a fiasco. Wagner sat through an evening of catcalls, snide comments, and staged interruptions. Things were worse the second night, when the dancers recruited even more friends, who came equipped with penny whistles. The whistles were accompanied by stamping and shrieking until all that could be heard of the opera were the drums. By the third night, Wagner was forced to admit defeat, and Tannhauser was taken off the schedule. Disgusted with Paris, he packed his bags and headed back to the homeland. Wagner was now fifty years old, and he was not a happy man. The icy reception in Paris was only part of his problems. Now he had fallen in love with Franz Liszt's daughter, Cosima, even though he was still married to Minna, even though he was still involved with Matilda, even though Cosima was married to the musician Hans von Bülow. And if this wasn't enough, Wagner also had two mistresses on the side. He spent his first years back in Germany juggling his many love affairs, 
racing about Europe's capital cities giving concerts and falling deeper and deeper into debt. Just in the nick of time, Wagner was rescued by a very unlikely source, the 19-year-old king of Bavaria, Ludwig II, a man of such eccentric and impulsive ways that he was nicknamed Ludwig the Mad. Ludwig, mad or not, had taken a liking to Wagner's music and adopted him as one of his court favorites. The first thing Wagner did was to get the king to appoint Hans von Bülow as his court pianist, so that von Bülow's wife Cosima would be within Wagner's reach. There was gossip about the two at court, but both the king and von Bülow refused to believe it. Wagner's next step was to set himself up in a life of luxury he'd always aspired to. The years of poverty had left their scars. Now he insisted on an elegant apartment, which he then filled with expensive carpets and velvet and satin wall hangings. He developed a taste for wearing heavy silk dressing gowns, of which he had twenty-four. I am, he told his friend Liszt, much better qualified to squander sixty thousand francs than to earn them. The people of Bavaria took a dislike to Wagner and his spending habits, and also to his attempts to interfere in Ludwig's government policies. Finally, when there were threats on his life, he was forced to flee yet another city. He returned to Switzerland, where the still doting King Ludwig bought him a home in Lucerne and mailed him a stipend. Ludwig's patronage of Wagner continued the last twenty years of Wagner's life and made it possible for him to complete and perform all his later works. Wagner's professional life in this period wasn't doing much better than his personal life. The critics were assaulting his bold new experiments in music and labeling it everything from noisy and humorless to pompous and formless. Wagner himself was called a charlatan, a vandal, and a melody-hating maniac. Back in Germany, Cosima von Bülow had given birth to Wagner's child, whom her husband accepted as his own. But now she joined Wagner in Switzerland, where the two took up house together, and Cosima gave birth to a second child. The couple eventually had three children, two girls and a boy. They were named after three characters from Wagner's operas, Isolde, Eva, and Siegfried. Von Bülow finally consented to a divorce after the third child, commenting, If it had been anyone else but Wagner, I would have shot him. The stress on Minna Wagner was greater, even though she and Wagner were living apart at the time. She had a fatal heart attack in the middle of all of it, and Wagner was finally free to marry Cosima, which he did in 1870, at the age of 57. In his marriage to Cosima, Wagner finally found some contentment. She was an adoring wife who devoted herself 100% to the interests and comfort of her husband. Finally, he believed he had found redemption through the love of a noble woman, which had always been one of his greatest hopes. During these years, Wagner began a friendship with the famous German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, whose ideas would later inspire Adolf Hitler. Nietzsche praised Wagner's defiance of tradition, and Wagner was attracted to Nietzsche's expansion of Schopenhauer's theories. The two became almost inseparable friends, but the friendship hit the rocks when Wagner developed an interest in religion, something Nietzsche had emphatically rejected. New problems emerged when Wagner's operas began to meet with success. Nietzsche had found his failure more noble. Success meant only decadence. Finally, Nietzsche was writing scathing critiques such as, My objections to Wagner are physiological. I breathe with difficulty as soon as his music begins to act on me. Even my stomach is in revolt. It was now the late 1870s, and Germany was entering a period of imperialism that was well suited to the music of Richard Wagner. The move in Germany now was to take pride in the country's achievements and in its achievers. Wagner was offered the opportunity to debut his now completed work, The Ring of the Nibelung, in the Bavarian city of Bayreuth. This first festival made history, and festivals have been repeated in Bayreuth ever since, except for a few cases when war interfered. Wagner insisted he be allowed to design and build a new theater for the debut of The Ring. The immense size and complex staging of his operas made all other theaters inadequate. His wish was granted and paid for by the generous financial aid of King Ludwig. Into that theater crowded emperors, a king, dukes, princes, and a variety of aristocrats. The opera was a triumph. Wagner was 63 years old and finally had experienced his first inarguable victory. He immediately began planning his next project, a religious festival play called Parsifal. It was completed five years later. By now Wagner's health had begun to deteriorate. He suffered from rheumatism and heart trouble, and an excruciating skin disease. He began taking trips to Italy, where the gentle climate seemed to relieve some of his discomfort. It was there on February 13, 1883, when he was 70 years old, that he had a fatal heart attack. At the time, he was working on a pamphlet about the feminine aspects of human nature. The last words he wrote were, Lieb tragique, or love and tragedy. They were the words that captured the essence of the life of Richard Wagner.
After his death, Wagner's music swept across Europe and then throughout the world, transforming the medium of opera. Now opera was grand and eloquent, vast and cosmic, offering new scope to the orchestra and the artists. When Wagner died, his wife Cosima dedicated herself to immortalizing Wagner's memory. She worked diligently to promote his music, and she also promoted his anti-Semitic views. Cosima helped organize a festival every year at Beirut to celebrate Wagner's work. Control of the festival was then passed down to their children and grandchildren, and today it is still the descendants of Richard Wagner who direct the festival at Beirut. It's the oldest summer music festival in Europe. Wagner planned the Beirut Theater with the hope it would serve as a model for other theaters. He felt the theater should be a center of culture and not just a place of entertainment. This vision of integrating the arts into the rest of society was just one of the many contributions Wagner made to music, but his largest contribution was his music itself. Unlike most composers before him, Wagner was a writer and a composer. He wrote the librettos, or words, for all his music. He called his operas music dramas to reflect his goal of uniting music and text for a more powerful effect. This synthesis of music, verse, and staging was completely new for its time. Wagner's music is not an easy listen. He uses melody and themes that constantly emerge, re-emerge, intertwine, disappear, and reappear. Because he carries dissonance, a combination of tones that seem to clash, to its extreme, some people consider his music ecstasy, others find it torture. The first great work Wagner completed was The Flying Dutchman. It's the only one of Wagner's work that stayed on the repertoire of every major opera house. It follows the tradition of operas before him, separate scenes, set pieces, and a few songs that bring the house down. But it also has signs of the later Wagner, the symbolism and the heavy tragic overtones. He said ten years later that the Dutchman's quest for salvation was like his desperate yearning, at the time he wrote it in Paris, to return to his German homeland. The heroine in the story, who wanted nothing more than to sacrifice herself for her lover, was, in Wagner's words, his longing for the redeeming woman, the ideal of womanhood in general, the woman of the future. Wagner's next most famous work was Tannhauser, completed when he was 31 years old. It had elements of the traditional Italian opera, but it also had elements of the new operatic form Wagner would perfect later. From tradition, there were the formal overture, the expected march, the predictable solo numbers and choruses. What was not traditional was the way Wagner integrated the music, words, and action. <laughs> 
Lindgren, completed after Tannhauser, is considered a climax in Wagner's work because it finally brought all the methods he'd been experimenting with before into unity. There were elements of German, French, and Italian opera styles, all synthesized into one dramatic new style. was Wagner's major work. It was a long and difficult project which was frequently interrupted so Wagner could complete other works. Wagner's task with the ring was to achieve something completely new in music, something that was part drama, part opera, and epic in story and form. It was to be the ultimate expression of the German soul. Wagner actually created the work backwards. He started with Siegfried's death at the end and worked to the beginning of the story from there. The music of the ring was unlike anything that had ever been attempted before. It was full and resonant, turbulent and vibrating, yet always melodic. It was the first opera in which the orchestra itself became a character. The ring makes use of a technique that Wagner became famous for. He called it Grundthemen, but today it's known as the leitmotif, which means leading motive. A leitmotif is a musical theme woven into the rest of the score that helps identify a particular character or episode. The ring has something for everyone. On the surface are its themes of German nationalism, international socialism, the philosophy of Schopenhauer, Buddhism, and Christianity. On another level are the psychological themes, power complexes arising from sexual repression, incest, mother fixation, and the Oedipus complex. On still another simple level is the dramatic epic, the inspiring and grand story that rivets the attention of the audience. In almost all his works, one can see Wagner's vision of a drama for music that could express the spirit of the German people and glorify the nation's culture. Then he turned to myth and legend in hopes his themes would have lasting universal value. Richard Wagner was a committed and idealistic artist. He tried to find a new way of combining music and drama so that music, which until then was the main focus, would instead blend with and enhance the drama. His vision was a form of theater in which all the elements of opera worked together towards a single, unified end. He was also, in a sense, a prophet. It was Richard Wagner who first said that opera would someday become entertainment for the elite and that a new kind of musical stage would emerge for the people. It was this new popular form of musical drama that he dedicated himself to creating. Wagner also waged a one-man war for the cause of artistic freedom, raising the awareness of many people to the need of creative artists for financial and moral support. He proposed taking opera out of the control of the court and forming a national theater whose productions would be under the control of a committee of dramatists and composers. Because of his ideas for reform, the court refused to stage his opera Lohengrin when it was completed. It's perhaps the greatest irony of this man's life that he so fervently fought for justice and freedom for one group of people while simultaneously defaming another. Wagner's anti-Semitism and his glorification of the German spirit and history were fully embraced 50 years later by dictator Adolf Hitler, who claimed Wagner was his only predecessor. It was Wagner's music that Hitler chose to accompany all his major speeches and parades. For that reason, Wagner, along with the philosophers Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, are forever linked in humanity's mind with one of the darkest and most appalling periods of human history. <laughs> 
Because of this association, Wagner's music has not been played in Israel since 1938. There have been questions as to whether this condemnation of Wagner is entirely fair. He died six years before Hitler was even born, and there's no way to know how he would have responded to fascism or the course Germany followed after him. Yet as an anti-Semite, and as an anti-Semite who published his views and attempted to influence people, he's as responsible for the rise of Hitler as all anti-Semites through history. He contributed to the climate of prejudice and hate that created the fertile ground for the work of Hitler and his colleagues. Wagner, like all of humanity, was a study in contradictions. He was a man who searched desperately for love and who firmly believed in the ideal that love could redeem man. Yet he was a man who also was driven by hatred and spite. He had an immense artistic integrity, but questionable integrity in his personal relationships. He attached himself to philosophies of self-denial and rejection of worldly desires, yet he sought luxury and privilege. Wagner's influence as a composer and as a musical dramatist was powerful. Much of the music that followed him was either inspired by an attempt to mimic him or to react against him. Ultimately, his life and his personal beliefs must be measured in the same way. There is much worthy of imitation. There is much deserving of rejection.